Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living History. Thank you for joining us. We've been doing a few movie reviews lately. There's been a lot of stuff going on in the world of movies and history. Uh, today, a little bit similar to that, but uh, it's uh, it's really just a good excuse to talk about everyone's favourite topic, which is dinosaurs, uh, because there's a new Jurassic Park film out, the uh, the last one in the uh, in the franchise, or so they say. Uh, but I thought it was a good opportunity to talk about some of the science behind the uh, the special effects that they do in the Jurassic franchise. And to uh, to help me with that, I'm joined by paleontologist Dave Ho- uh, Hone. Dave, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me on. <laughs> Mate, yes. I'm looking around your room there, and uh, compared to my rather drab settings here, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm seeing model dinosaurs, a lot of very interesting books, a lot of great images there. I mean, it just prompts me to say, I think you might have a job that we're all jealous of. So, can you tell us a little bit just about what you do there at the university? Yeah, um, yeah. This, this is this is this is only half of it. I mean, that, that's the quiet wall because it's got the whiteboard with my notes on this. The one I'm facing is a lot more books and a lot more models. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a lecturer at Queen Mary University in London, UK, um, and I mostly teach undergraduate zoology courses. Um, and I have a zoology background, so I did a zoology degree as my undergraduate, and then drifted is the only word really into paleontology. Uh, kind of moved sideways from living and recently dead stuff into very dead stuff. Um, and so, yeah, my most of my research is based around dinosaurs and pterosaurs, the flying reptiles that lived alongside dinosaurs but are not dinosaurs. I always have to make that point. Um, and I look at their behaviour and ecology mostly, though I've named uh, 15 or so species as well and other bits and bobs. And then I like doing outreach. I've got a podcast. I've written a couple of books. I've got another one coming. Um, so, yeah, there's a bit of kit and caboodle, really. Mate, it's fantastic. I mean, the first question I should ask you at the outset is, are you a fan of the whole Jurassic franchise? To be honest, not really. <laughs> um, I mean, partly at this point, just the, the grind of it, you know, six films even spread out over 20 years is a bit much. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think they're great films. And I include the original Jurassic Park in that. The more I rewatch it, the less I like it. And to be really clear, that's not because of the dinosaurs. I like that stuff. I find the rest of it kind of drags. Because, um, yeah, I, I, I love the old, you know, I've seen the original 1933 King Kong multiple times, which has some wonderful dinosaurs. I'm a massive Ray Harryhausen fan. There was a recent exhibition of some of his stuff in Scotland, and I was amazed to see that I got name-checked in some of the notes because I'd written this thing about how great Harryhausen's dinosaurs were. Like, look, even paleontologists think he's great. Um, and yeah, things like a right, million years BC is a bit rough, but things like Valley of Gwangi is a fantastic film. And it's a great film. And I think a lot of this stuff is, yeah, not even kind of, you know, I can watch dumb movies. Every, you know, I like dumb popcorn movies. I, I'm not immune to their charms. I just don't think these are a lot of fun, to be honest. We should Listen, ask. You may pick the wrong person. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for your time, Dave. Uh, we'll wrap up there. No, no, no. I, I think we're all in agreement on this. I think uh, you know it's it's a fun excuse to talk about dinosaurs rather than a, an engaging uh, you know movie review. Um, uh, well, I'll, I will ask you a question relating to the movie though. Is that science possible at some stage in the future? Are we going to be drawing DNA from uh, from mosquitoes in amber and and cloning dinosaurs? Basically, no. I mean, it's essentially impossible is you know with a, with my good scientist hat on i want to say never say never but this is you know so unbelievably unlikely and difficult in so many different ways um that you know it it's not even a near future thing you know maybe in the next century no, it, it's functionally impossible um dna just doesn't survive that long um, you know, to, to build an, an extinct organism like a dinosaur, you know, they're so long extinct. We're not talking about mammoths that are, you know, maybe separated by elephants or you know, a couple of hundred thousand years, or at least we've got, that's a slight mis- mis- misstatement of mammoths are more separate from elephants than that. But at least we've got mammoth DNA that's hundreds of thousands of years old. Even that stuff is badly degraded. It's chunks of DNA, which is a very, very long way from having a complete strand a very long way away from having a complete strand folded correctly, which is an important step that everyone tends to overlook as well. Um, And so if you can imagine, when we think hundreds of thousands of years is a problem, and the record for DNA is something like 
I want to say something like 700,000 years old. Bear in mind, I have nothing to do with this ever because it just doesn't show up for dinosaurs. If you're then going back to 65 million years, you know, if you can even get out some bits of fragments, you'd be doing astonishingly well. Um, but that's like having, you know, half a dozen nuts and bolts from a car and they're all crushed and degraded and broken as well and going, oh, yeah, we can build a working Ferrari from this. No, you can't. If you can get those nuts and bolts and, you know, a strip of rubber and one bit of plastic, you are not <laughs> rebuilding a working car from that. Um, you know, it just can't be done. You know, it's it's corner of a blueprint. It, it won't tell you anything. Um, and yeah, so you'll just never be able to do it. I mean, the fact that, you know, we've cloned a couple of sheep and they've died young because they didn't work very well tells you just how far away we are from even doing things like mammoths, let alone something like a dinosaur. Well, I think that's good because at the outset that clears up the, the movie aspects of the whole thing and, and what it enables us well, to do is... Well, you, you, you say that, but we've been saying that since the first one came out and yet here I am <laughs> still true. answering this question. That's which very is, true. Which is not to be disrespectful to you or the audience, but the fact is this keeps coming round because it keeps coming round. You know, th these ideas don't die. Um, they, they are sunk into the public consciousness and that's not an a, a, accusing the movie. It's fiction. But this really has become a thing that, you know, people think, oh, well, it's just a matter of time. And it really isn't. Well, I think it's an interesting thing. We don't want this to become a movie and, a, a you know, a, yeah. a, <laughs> like a, a, you know, a, a, a movie review, the, uh, you know, the science of movies. Um, but I've done several military, uh, you know, D-Day movie mm. reviews and things like that lately. And one of the things that does come out of that, and I think this applies to Jurassic Park as well, is it for better or worse, it does generate interest in the topic. I mean, the movies reflect what people are interested in. It's not the other way around. Um, and yeah. so I'm not saying that's necessarily the best thing in the world, but obviously there is a hu the Jurassic franchise is reflecting the interest that people, the, just the fascination we have with these, you know, millions of years old creatures. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, I, I guess, yeah, you're, you're right. It's a kind of double-edged sword, whereas on the one hand, you know, it continues to keep, dinosaurs interesting and in the public eye <clears throat> and all the rest of it the the you know the the other <laughs> the other side of that sword though is that as someone who does do a lot of outreach and engagement um you know people's perceptions are massively colored by that and um you know i've, I've commented on this before in the past but I, th I think it's it's just as true now in that i don't seem to have a problem with understanding that these are fiction and I can enjoy them or not based on their merits of that. But a huge number of members of the public and in particular kids seem to think that they're extremely accurate and realistic as far as I can tell, simply because they are movies. Um, and it's perhaps, you know, a little different with something historical, you know, D-Day was an actual event. The second world war was the Vietnam war, you know, whatever thing that, you know, people going into space, the moon landings, things like this, you know, you expect some fictionalized version of it, but you expect it to be at some level realistic. Whereas this is resurrected dinosaurs, you know, um, we, we shouldn't expect that to be particularly accurate. And yet, you know, uh, I, I go into schools and kids will tell me, no, no, they could do this. I saw it in the film. Um, and then that's when you start thinking, well, you need to have a chat with mum and dad about, you know, fiction versus reality um, and perhaps well, understand that this isn't a documentary. Well, that's what we're here to do, Dave, is, is uh, you know, off, as we said, off the back of the, the celebration <laughs> that there is a new Jurassic movie. But what I really wanted to get you on for was to talk about some of the reality of mm. the science of dinosaur hunting and our relationship as human beings with dinosaurs and what we understand about them. So that's what I want to do over the next 20 or 30 minutes is actually break it down and, and put some reality in there away from, from, from the big screen. Um, but, yeah, that, that's really what I'm looking forward to doing. I mean, I, I guess the first question is how long have we as human beings been involved in trying to learn more about dinosaurs? How long have we been digging up fossils and, and studying it and, and putting this information together? Well, for quite a long time. Um, so the first dinosaur was named or oh, 18... 24, 1829, something like that. Um, dinosaurs as a group weren't recognised for about another 15, 20 years. Um, the, those fossils had been dug up considerable time earlier 
and there's historical records of things going back to kind of the mid 1700s where there was these obviously strange bones from something big but no one really knew what they were being discussed in I'd say scientific circles but of course in the mid 1700s science is still semi-formalized you know there's lots of weirdness going on it's not quite the systematic study that it is now uh, and in hindsight, we can look back at some of those things and go, oh, OK, they're obviously dinosaurs or other fossil animals. Uh, and we're getting a, a handle on that. Um, systematic study really kind of kicks in in kind of the mid 1800s when we've got Darwin's theory of evolution coming through on top of now getting a handle on the geological record and the history of life on Earth and uh, comparative anatomy and, and lots of other things are opening up. There are records or at least there's suspicions of things going far, far, far behind that. Um, and so one of the contentious areas is just what influence dinosaurs and other fossils as well may have played on various earlier cultures. Um, and some of them are fairly plausible. Some of those, I think, are extremely implausible. Um, so one of the things I have seen in, in Canada, for example, if going out to Dinosaur Provincial Park in um Alberta is occasionally you find ammonites. It's actually famous for its dinosaurs, but occasionally you get ammonites, the little coiled marine seashells. And the um, apparently the, the local um, native peoples uh, could find chunks of these because they break off in little sections. And these were uh, used as kind of like bison tokens because actually once they've broken off, they've got a little lump at the front and then two little bits. So it's actually almost like a little miniature bison in profile, if, if you squint a bit. Um, and though that has apparently been, you know, a very common thing for a long time. So there is a fossil genuinely being, you know, integrated at a certain level into the culture and having a cultural meaning. On the other hand, you regularly see things of, oh, yes, the legends of dragons in, you know, in China or in South America, they come from people finding dinosaur fossils. And those I find very unconvincing because, you don't wander out into the desert and find a dinosaur skeleton. That's not how it works. And so I doubt, I'm sure these people were finding bones and bits. You can't not in the right places. Um, but I really doubt they're just walking past a whole skeleton in a hillside and going, wow, I wonder what that animal was and it somehow becoming, you know, part of the cultural legends or whatever, because fossils simply don't erode like that. Um, so there's very much two sides to that coin of the kind of deep history of uh, paleontology and, and study. But as a formal science, it's pretty new. But then so are the other sciences. Well, that was actually going to be my next question was, um, I know that it's not the case that, you know, you see in every movie when they're at a dinosaur dig, the big they pull back the big shot and there's a complete T-Rex. Skeleton on the hillside. Yeah, yeah. sitting there perfectly <laughs> preserved for, for 50 million years. Um what are scientists actively doing? What are paleontologists, what are they finding out there? Are we still finding dinosaurs? And what oh God, form yeah. are those discoveries taking? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we're still naming an average of about, I think it's about 45 to 50 species a year. And we've been wow. at that rate for 10, 12 years now. So in other words, we're adding one a week, give or take. Um, so, yeah, we're absolutely, and that's just new species. You know, we're finding plenty of skeletons of existing species as well on top of that. And that's just dinosaurs, of course, thousands of other extinct groups out there um we do still find occasionally you know really complete skeletons those those occasional shots as you know every documentary or every, certainly every film has to have the skeleton on a hillside those do turn up but you've got to dig down for them because of course what's happening is you know these things were buried 100 million years ago they've been underground they're now closer to the surface and erosion is clearing the hillside to expose them this is why whenever you do see documentaries or movies they're in a desert why because we can't dig for dinosaurs under a forest you'd have to clear the entire forest or whatever you know paris is paris is built in the paris basin oddly enough paris sits on a really quite nice fossiliferous layer we're not digging up dinosaurs in the center of paris for a fairly obvious reason um it, it's that sort of thing we go to desert simply because the erosion there isn't plant cover and the erosion is destroying the rock and slowly exposing the fossils. Um, but of course, what happens is if you leave that long enough, the fossil itself will start to erode as well. So what we're generally looking for is bits of bone coming out of a hillside telling us there's more in there, but it hasn't yet been degraded. And so 
we do occasionally dig through down and expose entire skeletons like you see as you say that you know that absolute cliche but what you won't do is walk into a field and see a skeleton like that because if it's been exposed at that level it is almost certainly degraded and what you'd see is hundreds and hundreds of shattered bits and i've come across skeletons like that in the field whereas we've been there five years earlier there was probably a complete articulated skeleton of a new species and what we actually found was a few thousand lumps of bone you know the size of my fist um just you know that was it you could you know it was a jigsaw with the edges worn off like you couldn't begin to put them back together uh so that that's largely what we're doing is wandering around looking for stuff in that regard it hasn't changed for 200 odd years how we find things uh and you do come across again partly inspired by what people have seen in things like jurassic park um you know people go oh well aren't you using you know seismic waves or other deep ground penetrating radar and scanning technologies and drones and all the rest of it. And the short answer is we've tried pretty much all of that and none of it works very well at all. So doing something very complicated and expensive, which works about as well as walking around looking, there's no point lugging expensive, difficult, awkward machinery into the field and then a generator and a petrol supply to run it to find less things than you could just on foot with your eyes open. Um, so it really is, you know, walking around with your eyes open and a geological hammer in your hand. And in, in that regard, I think paleo and actually, you know, I, probably anthropology and archaeology, though I can't really speak for them as well, um, is it hasn't changed in centuries. It's manual labor, <laughs> basically, which doesn't sound very 21st century science, but it is. Walk around until you see something and dig a hole in the rock to dig it out. I've been on a few archaeological digs and um, they're, they're, you know, as interesting as they are, they're much less sexy than they're often made out and often thought to be. Um, but that's because there's good solid work being done there. Uh, and I'm sure paleontology is the same. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's possibly unique because, of course, with archaeology, it's not usually buried so deep and not usually in so hard a rock uh, as we're dealing with. But, yeah, I, I think it, it is a very rare profession I have where on, in one week you can be extremely cerebral and sitting in front of a computer and running 3D simulations on your computer. And next week you've literally just got a pickaxe in your hand and the job is dig a deep hole <laughs> you think there can't be too many professions that combine these two you know if you if you're working on a building site you know the architect is not putting the bricks together and the, the, <laughs> the guys mixing the cement are not designing the, the layout of the electrical system um it's it's, it's, a, it's this bizarre combination of <laughs> classic cerebral academic ivory tower work and digging a hole <laughs> well, as you said, it's it's an evolving science. You know, it, it it's you know you're doing the work that was begun 200 years ago, and we are a long way from from the end of the journey. Um, are you still surprised by the things you uncover in the ground? Yeah, and and what we can do with them. So, um, so a small plug. I've just got a, a book out looking at the like the gaps in our knowledge and the things that I think we probably will fill in the coming years because either the discoveries are there or the technology is coming or the techniques have come to expose them. And then things that I think we we probably might never know because the, the, there's stuff which is you know effectively unknowable. Um, but what, the what's the book called, Dave? Uh, so in the UK and I think in Australia, it's called The Future of Dinosaurs, uh, but it's coming out in the States in a month under a different title, which is How Fast Did T-Rex Run? And I don't know which because the American publishers decided to change the name um, and the cover. And so I don't know which which version is coming out in which countries. So I believe it's available as the future of dinosaurs in Australia now, but I don't know if that's people importing it from the UK. And then I don't know if the Americans... So, God, no. Search for me and you'll find it if you're desperate. Yeah, look, look for Dave but Hone and, and, that, uh, and I'm sure... That's the up, easier so. bit. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, the, the one I always point to on this, for example, is colour. Whereas, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I was doing you know stuff like this, and people would always ask about the colour, and I'd say, we don't know. And to be honest, we're never going to know. And actually, now we've worked out how to do it. Brackets, massive caveat, sort of ish. But the, the fact that we've gone from it being something that I think I and, you know, pretty much all my colleagues would have said, you know, we're just never going to be able to work this out. It's just unknowable. And the fact that we have developed a technique to begin to reveal that is 
perhaps not quite a game changer because the, that that's still very, very early stuff. But the fact that it's even possible was just something that, yeah, I, I considered unimaginable. And they're just therefore just shows you how bad we are at interpreting the fossil record. And as you say, how much further we've still got to go. Well, tell us about that in layman's terms, if you can. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, we wanted this to be an interesting conversation about <laughs> yeah. dinosaurs. If you're talking about talking about, we now have a, a fair idea of the potentially the colour of dinosaurs. Yeah, tell us we, about that. We do. So, so what it comes down to is um, tetrapods, so mammals, birds, reptiles, um, uh, and I'm not sure about amphibians actually, but we don't need to worry about them. Uh, one of the main ways that colour is composed in them, and that includes us, are these little subcellular structures called melanosomes which contain various forms of melanin, which some people might well have heard of melanin. It tends to be a reddy brown colour through to black. So our hair colour, our skin colour, a lot of this is down to melanin. And indeed, it is in a lot of these other animals as well. It turns out more or less by a quirk of evolutionary history that different shades of melanin are preserved in different shaped melanosomes. So if you can imagine if you go to the hardware store, and red paint is always in a round pot, and black point paint is always in a square pot, and blue paint is always in a triangular pot or whatever. You don't actually need to see the colour to know what's in there. The shape alone will tell you what colour it is. And it turns out that in a few rare fossils, the melanosomes are still preserved. The colour inside is gone, but since we know that in basically all living <laughs> tetrapods, the colour is linked to the shape that it's in, it's reasonable to infer that's also true of dinosaurs and, by the way, also fossil birds and reptiles and mammals and some other things as well. And we start to look at them, started in dinosaurs. We can look at the skeleton, we can look at the fossil with feathers or skin or whatever it has. We can look in a very powerful microscope to find the melanosomes. We can see what shape they are. We know what color that bit of the animal was. We can therefore have an idea of its color and pattern. What, what is it telling us about the colours of dinosaurs? What have you learned? Um, so some have pretty camouflage colours, which isn't a massive surprise, but it's still very nice to see. Uh, some are largely camouflaged, but with some bright red patches on them in places, which again is kind of what we see in quite a few things like, you know, woodpeckers. We've got, we've got a couple of dinosaurs which are black with some white patches and spots on them, and then a bright red head. And it's like, that's not a million miles away from quite a few woodpecker species and various other things like that. Uh, you know, a bit of display against a generally camouflaged background. Um, that's about as far as we've got. As I say, it's early days. We've worked this out for about half a dozen animals. For each of those, we've only done one individual. So it may not tell us very much about what the species as a whole is like. Males and females are probably going to be different. Adults and juveniles are probably going to be different. Uh, they might molt in winter. Most of these come from a fossil beds where we know it's very cold and there's probably a lot of snow in winter. So it could well be that they turned white then. Um, all of that stuff is still yet to come. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the melanosomes and their orientation, which we don't have, is only part of the colour story. So it's it's more like we're, we're, we're looking at dinosaurs through some kind of Instagram filter, where it's giving you an idea of what that real colour is, but it's probably not giving you the true colours. Uh, but again, the fact that we can do that when we'd assumed it would just be a blank image forever is, you know, just such an enormous step forward. Um, and, you know, who knows what we're going to work out in future now we're beginning to get a handle on this much uh so it's definitely an area that's gonna just get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more detailed it's just gonna take time that's extraordinary even, even to say that you know black with white spots and a red head i mean these are not how people envisage dinosaurs what well, let's talk a little bit more about that what are the what are the discoveries that that paleontologists are making that are changing our perspective of what dinosaurs are like because we all have the, the impression of a brontosaurus drab brown you know we, we all think yeah. we know what a dinosaur looked like what are the things that might surprise us a little bit that, that that we're now discovering about dinosaurs um i mean i think i'd like to think that by now you know feathers is just a, a known thing that you know a large number of dinosaurs uh, particularly the bipedal carnivores uh, including t-rex brackets probably had feathers of some description of them uh, on them uh that's one of those things which is like most people I tell that to go, yeah, 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 I knew that. And then every so often there'll be one person going, what? 
it's, 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 it's utter news to them. So I never know quite how universally understood this is. But yeah, lots of dinosaurs had feathers. Um, so we know that much. Again, people still have, you know, this is one thing Jurassic Park did do well, at least the first couple really brought them forward in terms of going from those, as you say, very drab, tail dragging, fairly slow, potentially stupid, hanging around in water kind of picture to a, to a much more, you know, late 20th century and into the 21st century view. Though, frankly, the some of the Jurassic World films have actually dialed back on that and they have rather more 60s looking dinosaurs, which is therefore really does a disservice to the to the modern science. Um, but yeah, you know, dinosaurs are fundamentally more bird-like than lizard-like. These are upright, active, probably inverted commas, warm-blooded animals, um, plenty of which were pretty smart. Um, I'm not suggesting they were geniuses by any stretch of the imagination, but the idea that, you know, they're kind of dumb as a rock and, you know, you hit them and about five minutes later they might go, ow, um, you know, this just isn't true at all. <laughs> Uh, and certainly, you know, the very bird-like ones were very bird-like. I know that sounds um, trite <laughs> to the point of redundant, but, you know, those dinosaurs that are closest to the bird lineage, so birds are literally living dinosaurs, um, you know, if I magically waved a magic wand and, you know, and pulled one out of the ground and made it alive and had it running around a park, um, you know, gliding or possibly flapping awkwardly between trees most people wouldn't give it a second glance. It would look like a bird. Um, and weird one with teeth and some bigger claws than you might be expecting, but fundamentally a bird. And it would have the traits and habits of birds, which is, I think, beyond what a lot of people realise. You know, they're looking after their young. They're brooding nest, uh, eggs in nests. They're running around at night. They're, some of them are probably quite smart. Um, these are... You know, they are and indeed were, you know, living animals, which, again, sounds kind of trite. You know, duh, they were living animals. Yeah, but people think of them as bones. And the thing is, that's what we've got left of them. But that's not what they were. They, you know, they ran around, they climbed, they signaled to each other, they mated, they looked after their offspring. Some of them had to solve puzzles. Uh, they ate stuff. They had to find food. They had to migrate. They had to live through difficult conditions. They were evolving organisms over 150 million years. That's a pretty big thing. And so to reduce it to, oh, look how big many of them were, uh, I think does them a pretty big disservice. Well, I think it's one of the things that perhaps the original Jurassic Park did well that we should give it credit for is it might be a symptom of the fact that early dinosaur movies, the dinosaurs were all made out of plasticine or they were badly working <laughs> yeah. puppets or, you know, it limited how we could depict them simply by the technology of the movie. I think it is one thing that the original Jurassic Park did do, particularly with things like the T-Rex, you know, the carnivores, to give them speed, to give them strength in a, in a way we hadn't seen before. Because it, when you see these, you know, I don't know anything much about dinosaurs, but when <laughs> I see these big these predators... They look like yeah. they've got long legs, they've got lots of muscles, they've got things that suggest they could move pretty quickly, which they would have to to chase down prey. Um, and I think probably the original Jurassic Park is one of the first movies that actually took that approach compared to the lumbering T-Rex that sort of wanders around and then falls over when you throw a rock at it. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, going back to Harryhausen, if you look at something like One Million Years BC, you know, the, the theropods there are pretty quick and run around and, and jump and do some fairly active things. But they've still got this very kind of called the kangaroo pose where, you know, they bolt upright with the you know head pointing almost skywards and then the tail down at the ground. Uh, but he had them moving pretty fast. And that was, again, quite novel then, in a, you know, you'd still see, admittedly, the bad dinosaur books of that era showing them as, you know, oh, they only survive when they're chest deep in water and all the rest of it. Um, but, yeah, getting that posture right, and as you're, you're right, you know, getting them running around at night uh, and things like this, you know, made really quite a difference. Um, but going back to a slight bit of movie critiquing, uh, you know, one of the things that Spielberg did do was he hid them. You know, rather like Jaws, where, where, where famously you don't see the shark because the damn thing never worked. I, I think part of the reason you don't see the T-Rex for so long and when you do it shows up at night is it's easier to hide the fact that some of the CGI was a little bit clunky and the, the giant animatronic, though brilliant though it was, you know, was 
had no legs because you can't make the thing that size run around. Um, and, you know, shooting it at night with a rainstorm really helps hide that quite effectively. And so it, it, it it's not as obvious. And I think part of the problem with some of the films that have come since is everything's in bright daylight and, and trying to interact in a real brightly lit world. And that is always going to highlight those tiny bits of CG where you can never quite match the lighting and the depth of field and the subtlety of the focus and stuff like this. And therefore actually makes them stick out when people say, Oh, you know, the CGI doesn't look very good. Often it's absolutely astronomically good. It just, there's enough uncanny Valley that your eyes pick it up and you can mask that very easily by dropping the light level and having one spotlight from, from a car, from a car headlight that you can turn off and on and, and, and flicker a bit. Um, but, the flip side of that is it actually shows them, you know, doing things, as you say, that people didn't show before. And again, like, you know, even documentaries, even like, the, you know, the recent prehistoric planet, which is absolutely magnificent. But you can go back to things like Walking with Dinosaurs. Um, we had a Planet of Dinosaurs about 15 years ago and stuff like this. You know, they don't show dinosaurs at night. Why? Because it's, <laughs> people don't want to see that or, or kind of don't expect to see that. Uh, and you often, again, my point about, you know, dinosaurs as living animals, again, from a movie and even a documentary point of view, it's not very interesting to show dinosaurs doing what they were probably doing the vast majority of the time, which is either eating or sleeping. You know, even when we watch the, the best wildlife documentaries, no one wants to watch a real time film about lions, which consists of them sleeping for 22 hours a day and then occasionally getting up and lumbering to a waterhole and every three or four days trying to dismember something and eat it. That doesn't make great TV, but that's probably what T-Rex was doing. And, you know, a Patasaurus is probably eating 20 hours a day because otherwise it's going to run out of food. That doesn't make great TV or a movie either. Uh, what we have to have is them killing each other or mating or, you know, or trying to migrate or cross a river or do something more exciting. But it does mean you end up with this, you know, rather biased view of them, again, as as living animals and what a normal day was like for them. What are they getting right in these movies, Dave? Because we've talked about a few of the things that they've, you know, obviously the, there's, there's, there's many inconsistencies with the science. But from your position, when you look at that, you go, okay, you know, they've done that well. What are those things? Are there um, any? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a handful. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I, I I think like almost any progression in this sort of way, it's you know get, getting even close to begin with is extremely difficult, and then you start getting into the details, and then the details of the details, and then the details of the de- you know you you can go on forever, you know, and with with my level of knowledge and understanding. You know, I, I can start nitpicking about, well, you know, that toe's not at quite the right angle that it really should be. Uh, and then you, you go, oh, come on. Now, now, you know, I feel bad that I'm nitpicking at this level. Um, but there's there's definitely better and worse models that, you know, look more or less accurate um, in, in, in how they're portrayed. I mean, the thing that I always find, you know, kind of annoying and egregious is when the, is when there's you know really weird things like like pteranodon, so the the big winged reptile, the big head crest out the back of its head that pretty much everyone knows. You know, you see pteranodon absolutely everywhere. Pteranodon's name means toothless wing. It, it's the flying one with no teeth, and they put teeth in it, and it's like someone's gone to the trouble of making a model and animating it with a feature that it's named for not having, that <laughs> seems like a real waste of time and effort to make something actively worse than it should be. Um, and that's the stuff which I, I find, you know, kind of really annoying because there is I can't conceive of the reason for it. Um, presumably the reason is we thought it looked better, which on the one hand, again, Fair enough, it's a movie. If that's what you want to do, go for it. But on the other hand, come on. <laughs> you know, I don't think anyone is paying that much attention to details like that, um, except perhaps me. And then, as I say, you know, someone's actually gone to the effort of doing it. Um, but yeah, the, the original T-Rex, it's got its problems, but it's actually pretty good. The original Triceratops is great. Um some of the yes, some of the other horned dinosaurs are pretty good. 
Um, yeah, but you know, th- things change as well. You know, the Stegosaurus is so in the original Jurassic Park Lost World, so Jurassic Park 2, effectively. The Stegosaurus in that is magnificent. I think it's just about the best model they produced. It's a bit big, in fact, it's very big, but other than that, it looks magnificent. And then they, they redid it in the Lost World series, and it looks awful. They, they've completely changed the posture and made it look like a, you know, 60s kind of tail dragger. And and it's like, again, you know, someone's taken an existing, good, accurate, detailed model and actively made it worse. And for what purpose is beyond me? What do you think it is, Dave? Why are we so fascinated with dinosaurs, what is it that just makes? Because as we said, that these movies aren't made in a vacuum. They're made because <laughs> yeah. every kid has a lunchbox with a dinosaur on it. So many adults. My beautiful wife loves dinosaurs. She's going to be watching this excitedly when we finish. You know, we finish filming here. <laughs> what is it that makes us love them so much? I mean, if if I knew that, I'd write a best selling book on it because I've been asked that question almost every podcast and interview I've ever done. I've seen it posed in almost every popular science book that I've read no no one knows is the is the real secret um or the real answer i mean i can think of several things which might be pushing bits of it i mean i think the natural world in general is popular you know zoos are popular the outdoors is popular and people tend to like bigger weirder things they like elephants they like giraffes they like lions this is all of those things writ very very large um and you know they have a strangeness to them which is kind of simultaneously alien because there's really nothing quite like a diplodocus but also familiar they are reptiles they are part of earth's history um and that that's one side of them um i've seen people kind of say uh one one thing i quite liked was the idea that kids really like them because they're safe danger if that makes sense You know, T-Rex is unbelievably massive and giant and powerful and scary, but it is dead and it is only a skeleton. And that gives a, you know, that gives you a little bit of safety whilst it being a fascinating, dangerous animal. Um, One thing that I've thought about myself quite a lot in recent years is the kind of way they came into public consciousness. And I wonder if it's almost a massive cultural hangover from, yeah, the 1800s when you know, the the general public kind of went science mad in general. You know, you, you have these historical stuff of, you know, scientists giving public talks and they're being rammed to the gills, you know, and people queuing up outside and pushing to get in and women fainting and people being killed in the crack to hear a lecture about oxygen or combustion or, you know, coal mines. You know, people were really doing this. And into that came dinosaurs, a totally alien thing, unlike anything else, and then very quickly we found complete skeletons. So we weren't knocking around with odd bits and bobs, but we had whole skeletons. You know, relatively quickly we had, you know, things like Diplodocus and Allosaurus and Stegosaurus, like whole complete skeletons coming out of the ground and being, um, you know, illustrated and shared around. And that must have made its mark. Uh, I mean, you can point to uh, one that I only found out fairly recently because I don't read the classics, uh, but Charles Dickens mentions Megalosaurus in his opening line, I think, of ta- opening page of Tale of Two Cities. That's a cultural touchstone which he is using because he knows his readers will get it. And that tells you something about just how important dinosaurs became almost instantly. And then I think it just becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If dinosaurs are popular with adults and kids, well, they're going to be popular with the next generation of adults and kids because you're going to grow up with them. And actually, this is something Crichton said when he wrote Jurassic Park. As I recall, he said he'd had the idea for it, you know, 10 or if not 15 years before he wrote the book. And he was waiting for dinosaurs to be less popular because he didn't want to jump on the bandwagon. And it just seemed like well, every week there's a dinosaur story in the media and every year there's a big new exhibition in one of the museums or there's a documentary. And it's just need that to die down and, and then I'll go for it. And after 15 years, he realized that no, it was never going to die down. There was always going to be queues at the museum and yeah, lunch boxes and new media articles and they've been the cover of National Geographic and it's just never going to die. Um, and again, you know, you, you go into almost any bookshop and there will be a rack of kids' books for dinosaurs. Um, and as long as that's 
very highly available, and if he doesn't always seems to be the most common thing that's out there, they're going to be bought. And as long as they're going to be bought, there's going to be a market for them, and they're going to publish more. And that cycle, I don't think, is ever going to stop. Um, but you know, those are some fairly vague answers that I don't think quite explain just how popular they are. As we finish up, um, let's get back to the science. What are the developments in paleontology? Is there anything going on at the moment that really excites you that over the next decade you're really looking forward to seeing how it develops? What's happening in your world that's that's making you excited? I mean, actually, the, the colour thing, going back to that, because one thing that I do a lot of work on is, excuse me, sexual selection and social communication. So, you know, displays and signals and all the rest of it. Um, and I'm inevitably forced to work primarily from bones because that's what we mostly have. And so looking at things like frills and horns and crests and spikes and, and stuff like that and what they're doing. But of course, color is a massively important signal for animals. Um, less so in mammals, admittedly, but we've got fairly, apart from various primates, mammals have fairly limited color vision. Dinosaurs would have had the same vision as birds and reptiles, which means that they can see into UV. Um, so they've got enormous range of color vision. So color is going to be a massively important thing for them. And we've got a terrible handle on that. And as I kind of said, you know, we've, we've got things like a couple of dinosaurs where it's like we've got a pretty good idea of the color of one. Well, right. But is, is that a male in the breeding season or is that a female in her camouflage plumage or what and how does that change over time and different places and different ages and all the rest of it is going to give us a much much bigger and better understanding of what those colors are trying to do and how they're being used um, and personally i think that colors and signals had a very important role to play in the very origin of feathers and their spread across dinosaurs and therefore as a pre-flight adaptation uh, you know, th this is a massive part of bird evolution and understanding what role colour was playing in them, you know, could, could because you've always got to be careful, but, you know, could could really begin to answer that question, you know, properly and kind of once and for all. And so that is an area that even though I'm not really working in it because I'm not playing around with these fossils and looking at that colour, but where that's going is, you know, really interesting for, for one area of research that I'm interested in. Um, and probably the other big one is is just the technological expansion. You know, all scientists have always embraced technology. Paleo is a pretty poor field. We're reliant on secondhand, <laughs> you know, next generation technology where it becomes cheap enough that we can afford to borrow it or buy it um, off usually the medics and the vets and, and often the engineers. But the fact that, you know, we're, we're now, you know, building digital models of skeletons what used to take weeks or months of work, you can almost now do in an hour with an iPhone. Um, and then you can import that into computer programs to start looking at how bones articulate, how joints work, where muscles attach. And from that, you can start working out how quickly they moved, whether or not they could rear up, how far they could bend a neck or a knee joint and stuff like this. That is just getting faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And I can you know, I'm not one to make technological predictions. And as we all know, every, every technological prediction of X will happen in the next 10 years, 10 years from now, you'll be saying X will happen in the next 10 years. But I can really see in the future, this is getting to the point that we could automate that, you know, maybe not for decades, but I can honestly foresee a, a time where, you know, you, you'd whip your phone out, your basic camera, you'd walk around a skeleton, scan it, and the computer will automatically reassemble the bones because it knows what they all are and where they should go, you know undo breaks and restore deformities and then go all right that 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 and that those are muscle points that connect to this 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 and this and if they do that they'll be this big and the joint will function that way and it will just do it all and you know in minutes you could walk out of there with a complete pattern of how well this animal moved and what it could and couldn't do i i am very sure that's coming though how soon <laughs> really really am not going to bet well we'll keep an eye at it for it it's uh, it's all fascinating stuff david and uh no, whether or not people see Jurassic, the Jurassic Park movies, I don't think we really care about. But what I must say to anyone listening or watching this video is um, is, is seek out David's work. Uh, we, so we mentioned the books, David. What else should people be looking for if they want to know more about your work with dinosaurs? I mean, probably the easiest thing, I, I have a website, davehone.co.uk, that's got links to my books. It's got links to my podcast. It's got links to my blog. Uh, you can find my Twitter handle. You can find my research papers. Um 
there's if people are desperate to contact me, my email address is on there. But please don't. I get far too many emails. At the <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I think Jurassic Park has just generated the next wave. But the last couple of weeks, it has been, you know, an email a day, which doesn't sound like much but when it's a long list of questions. And you don't want to disappoint people. On the other hand, I have got better things to do than answer a question I've answered 20 times already this month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let, leave it there if you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's encourage people to do that. Go and check out David's work and uh, in a very passive manner. Um, but no, we appreciate you. We appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us about it because, uh, as I said, we've only just scratched the surface. I mean, you know, there's there's as many questions as there are dinosaurs. Um, but it's just been so great, mate. And it's it's great work you're doing and you're delivering in a way that is uh, is very entertaining and consuming for people as well. So uh, we appreciate thank you taking you. the time. And as I said, I encourage everyone to go and check it out. But uh, in the meantime, Dave, thank you so much for joining us on Living History. Thanks for having me again.